So uh, welcome everyone and thanks for being here. We've gotten a chance to know each other a bit um, off offline, but excited to be spending some time with you and, and learning from every, every panelist here. Um, I'm super confident this is gonna be a good discussion and a great learning opportunity. So to be uh, clear and direct, the purpose of the chat um, is to honor AAPI Heritage Month and simply to encourage us to improve as an industry in baseball. Um, and as a result, hopefully as a society, uh, improve at inclusion and acceptance. So uh, to get better, I, I believe that we have to understand and discuss what's happening, both in baseball and elsewhere. Uh, and as such, I think it's important to recognize that the, the Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism at CSU San Bernardino released findings in early March that showed hate crimes against Asian Americans spiked nearly 150% between 2019 and 2020. So how to stop these hate crimes is everything, everything. Um, and there are so many who have to change their behavior and many responsible for, for stepping up to make changes themselves and, and help to create avenues for others to make changes. One way um, that I'm extremely passionate about is creating more diversity in the workplace. Um, that's just one necessary step in, in this big staircase. Uh, so that's one of the main reasons that I started Pipeline for Change. Our mission is to help baseball have a more diverse and inclusive group of decision makers and then to do the same um, and amplify in sports and society. So with that, we have a very cool panel today and I'm excited to pass the Zoom mic to Leanna to introduce herself and then let's go around the horn and, and have everyone do the same. I am Leanna Louie, I'm a DEI consultant and sports philanthropist. I uh, formerly worked with the San Jose Giants in the front office and participated in the Major League Diversity Business Summit. I use the pronoun she and hers. Hey everybody, I'm Carmen Q. Um, I'm a co-host of Triples Alley, the Giants post post game. And coming this May, we'll be doing Giants post game on Sundays. Um, lifelong baseball fan and uh, advocate for uh, equality, racial equality around, around the globe. Good to be here. Hi, everybody. Jerry Wan here, a founder of Just Like Media. We're an Asian American storytelling company. I work with a lot of companies and organizations on sharing the Asian American workplace or workplace experience. Um, fun fact, I'm a lifelong Dodger fan, which uh, makes this conversation that much more important that we can put those uh, fun differences aside and have this very important conversation. My name is Travis Chalk. I'm the founder of the lifestyle apparel brand Baseballism. Um, played baseball my whole life, played some college ball at the University of Oregon. Uh, coached um, at the uh, college and high school levels. So I got a depth of baseball knowledge along with being Asian. And uh, usually when I played baseball on the mainland, I'm from, originally from Hawaii. I was the only Asian guy on my team. So I have that perspective to uh, bring to the bring to the table. So um, it's great to be here. And uh, thanks, thanks to Gabe for uh, giving us this platform. Very cool. I uh, appreciate everyone and their, their quick introduction. Um, I just wanted to hop right into the discussion, if, if that makes sense for everyone. And I, I mentioned kind of amplifying voices uh, earlier, but I'd like to talk about allyship and um, in particular hate crimes against your community. So really interested in how we can help. And I thought we could kick to Carmen here and, and then just kind of go around and, and chat about this a bit. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that that we've seen a lot of is is uh, during these kind of violent attacks on Asian people is that there are typically a lot of bystanders um, who maybe aren't doing anything or, you know, they're recording, but they're not kind of speaking up. Um, so I think being a vocal ally is something that everyone can really do. I know there's many kind of sources of bystander training um, that are going on. Um, around online that people can take to kind of better educate themselves. But beyond kind of seeing something and saying something, I think it's continuing to be a vocal ally for all communities that are marginalized and speaking up even when there aren't maybe necessarily big media hits going on of, of 
hate crimes, but kind of continuing your advocacy beyond kind of those tentpole moments. Um, because uh, I think as a lot of Asian people will tell you, there's a rise in hate crimes, but none of this is new to us. I don't think any of us are surprised by kind of what's been happening. It's just become more amplified. Um, and, and so I think the continued support beyond kind of this very moment in time um, for, our, for all races is very important. We have to address biases. And one of the biggest biases against the AAPI community is the model minority myth. And the premise behind that is that Asian Americans, and when we say the minor, model minority myth, I'm talking about East Asian Americans and not including the South um, East Amer Asian Americans in this group, but like in this stereotype is that we are the ethnic group that are law abiding citizens, we're submissive, we're the silent minority, but we were the successful, the most successful ethnic group out of all the different groups out there and cultures and that we were able to succeed in this American dream because we we boot, bootstrapped everything we did and we just worked hard and stayed silent and went through the motions every day and we didn't voice our opinions and I think that's so problematic in this arena of social justice and racial equality and it does a lot of negative things that harm like it harms the diversity of Asian AAPI cultures altogether, and it also perpetuates anti-Blackness, pegging Black Americans against Asian Americans, and that we need to fight for each other, but really, we should be formally forming a rainbow coalition together and really standing against racism and, like, white supremacy altogether. It also creates this unnecessary, like, competition between people of color, that there's not enough space for everybody at the table when there's plenty of space, and we need to be cognizant of making space for all these different groups to raise their voice, make a statement, and really represent their cultures. I had a, a quick uh, follow-up question, uh, Leanna, as, as you were talking, I um, mean, you talked about um, Black Americans and Asian Americans being uh, pitted against one another. And it made me think about um, a lot of the movies that I saw growing up. Um, how much of a responsibility does um, entertainment play? Um, and in particular, like movies and, and television, definitely when I was growing up, but I'm not sure how prevalent that is right, right now. I think people, it just perpetuates the model minority myth and people really use as the real life example, well, they show it on media or they show it in a movie that must be real, that must be true. I mean, we'll talk about it later, but also like over-sexualization of API and just a whole bunch of stereotypes come out of the media, unfortunately. And it's up to us to make sure we make programming that is very relevant and shows representation for all cultures. Kind of to stem on that too, to add to what Liana said is like I think there's a there's diversity amongst Asians, and I think when when you look at you know what's televised, you know whether it be MLB or in movies, it doesn't really show the how diverse we are within our culture, right? I'm a I'm a fifth generation Asian American. My my great great grandmother was born in America. My family's been here since the eight, since the 1800s, and so when I look on TV, there's nobody like me, right? There's there's not when when I watch you know. Um, you know, crazy rich Asians. Um, the mom's got a heavy, heavy Asian accent, um, second generation Asian, or they're surrounded by, you know, people that don't speak English. And so all I know is English. And, uh, and a lot of times because of these stereotypes that are shown on TV, people think I, I speak a different language. When that's just not the truth. Like I consider myself to be as American as can be, but because what's portrayed on TV and even in the MLB when it comes, because there are so many, you know, Japanese stars and Korean stars in the MLB, you don't see the Asian Americans like the Colton Wongs, you know, the Kyle Higashiokas that, that can ball, but they're Asian American, but they're not portrayed. But because of, you know, the stars that are from Japan and from Korea, for the, for the most part, a lot of people think that they're not from America and they're not American. So I think that's something that can be changed. It's just, just giving people another perspective on, on, different Asian cultures within our culture. Jerry, did you have anything on this one? Uh, I, I think we can, address, I mean, one, I mean, Travis brings up a good point, right? Like we always talk about a buzzword within the community is disaggregation and, and self-identity. 
And so when we break down intergenerationally for Travis family, you know, fifth generation is very different than recent immigrant, even more recent than that. If you're studying here or you're working here, your identity isn't actually even Asian American. You just happen to be an Asian person that is working or studying in America. And so how you receive certain uh, comments, uh, microaggressions is also received very differently. And also to Travis's point, particularly in baseball, the majority of Asian players are Asian born and come here at a much later, more mature part of their careers. And so, yes, language is different, but also culture is very different. And, and those folks um, come here with a mission of just playing baseball. And so whether it is getting active within the Asian American communities locally or nationally or advocating for that, I, I think it's very different. And so, so, you know, one is not better or more right than the other. It just makes uh, talking about this within and outside of our community more nuanced and more complex. And I think people initially realize because there are many different layers, um, but I don't think we're unique. If you talk to you know our, our friends from the Latinx community, immigration history pattern and identity and country of origin play a very significant role in how one sees themselves and, and how you know in America, it's really easy to bucket folks into black, brown and Asian and indigenous. But within those groups, it, it is much more nuanced and complex than, than we ever thought. I think it's fascinating. First of all, thanks everyone for the answers on this particular topic. Um, I'm particularly fascinated because of how difficult nuance is in, in sports to, to really bake into these, these, these discussions. And um, I think one way that, you know, I'm going to learn a lot is just by hearing um, kind of specific action steps at some point, not necessarily on this call, um, how to introduce some of that, that nuance into the clubhouse discussions, uh, because it, it, it requires some degree of education. You guys are all um, so well versed in, in having this conversation is so important for us to have it and, and for, for me to listen carefully. But um, at some point um, over the years, I'd like to get um, or more specifically in the weeks, months ahead, and then ultimately over the years, learn about how to introduce some of this nuance into, into our clubhouse. So um, I think this would be a good time to kind of uh, move on to the next topic. Um, and, and that is, what are the problematic issues that the AAPI community is facing that translates over to professional sports, particularly in baseball? And I think the, the previous conversation was a nice segue for this. Yeah, I can take some of this. Um, I think for me, um, it starts at the youth level um, because obviously in order to be a major league baseball player, professional sport of any kind, you gotta, you gotta have a strong youth channel. And at least for me growing up, you know, I'm from Hawaii, where the majority is is, is the minority. So um, it was it was easy for me to play baseball growing up. Um, coming to the mainland, um, if, if you look at your your normal travel baseball team, 12U, whatever it is, you're not going to see a lot of Asian people playing baseball. And there's been very strong efforts, you know, to to get more African American, you know, Latin American people playing baseball. But if you look at the Asian community, it's, it's kind of been left behind. So I think that's why you see so few Asian Americans playing professional baseball. I mean, you can name a few, but for the most part, like we talked about earlier, there's a lot of international players coming from overseas to play professional baseball. And baseball is special because, I mean, it's not like basketball where, you know, Asians are a little bit genetically challenged vertically when it comes to, you know, being six foot seven and, and you know, and dunking on people or whatever. But baseball is a sport that's, that's the majority that's required is skill. And Asian Americans have been seen to succeed in baseball, coming from Japan, coming from Korea. And there's no reason why there shouldn't be more Asian Americans playing professional baseball that are born in America. So I think that's one effort that, that needs to be done is, is making an effort to you know, expose baseball to Asian American people and having that effort. And I don't think it's been done before. I mean, adding to that, I think it's, you know, talking about like youth sports, right? Like, um, as in, in your case, Travis, you've been here a long time. It is the dominant culture or sort of the ratio group in Hawaii. But for the younger generation, like I was born in Korea. I came here when I was eight and my parents signed me up for Little League here in Orange County. And everybody, every adult in the Little League system was white, right? Because that's whose parents had the financial luxury, the knowledge, the relationships to get involved in these things. All the Asian kids' parents, even if they have got signed up for Little League or NJB basketball or whatever, we're busy running their businesses trying to survive, right? So I think we're also going through this generational shift where I have two young kids of my own. Like I've committed 
to myself, to my kids and to my partner that I'm going to be active in their, uh, you know, extracurriculars, because that's something I didn't get to have, not to blame any of our parents for not being present, but they just didn't know. There's no coaching of basketball in Korea for youth by parents, right? And so it, it's this sort of, you know, it's going to take decades in, in, in some respects. And, and I think on that same note, in the terms of, you know, um, how it relates to professional sports, uh, is a, a part of the myth of meritocracy, that the best players advance, that the best players make it to the next level. But we know that that's not the case. And even if that were the case, does every kid, regardless of color or background, have the equal opportunity to achieve those results? And, and so where I think that sort of manifests itself also, uh, particularly in sports, is uh, as it represents itself in toxic masculinity. When we talk about racial biases, racial slurs, uh, you know, microaggressions uh, directed towards anybody, um, you know, I have not been in many professional sports locker rooms or, you know, even collegiate at that. But when you're talking with the boys, right, there's this notion of suck it up, don't be so soft, you know, it's just a joke. And those are technically now we know it as gaslighting, but those conversations are really then uh, the, the, the victims or the oppressed are e even more so forced to just suck it up, turn the other cheek, or even participate in self-derogatory commenting to be either accepted or to feel like they need to do that to advance in this hyper-competitive world that we know as professional sports, right? And so, you know, I, I think overall sort of what do we need to do? I, I know we're talking at the professional level, but having parents, uh, administrators, teachers at the youngest levels be knowledgeable about some of the things that they should be looking out for, making sure that the opportunities are equal, but also that the places are safe. So that if you hear something that you, you have to cut it out and that kids don't even, you know, I'm sure there are kids who quit playing any sort of sport because of the things that they hear on the field or on the court. We hear that at the highest professional levels. And so, you know, how do we, how do we just make sure that, you know, baseball or basketball or anything can be equal or as equal as possible physical, you know, and, and so that the real true best players or the best, you know, uh, performing athletes can, can thrive. So I, I think that's really, you know, it, it is not, it has to start at home. At really, really at, at a young level. And, and so, you know, I, I, you know, I guess a question for you, uh, Gabe, is sort of what is your, you've, you've played at, you know, at, at all levels. Um, you've now been uh, a manager. Like you've heard probably some of these things, right? Um, at, as locker rooms, like what, what are your thoughts on, you know, team's responsibility, fellow players, coaches, managers, equipment guys who just happen to be there, like, is there enough self-policing of that sort of dialogue or is it just, you know, or are we getting to a better place of that? Oh, we're not, we're not where we need to be. That's for sure. And um, you mentioned that I've, I've kind of been around this game from a, a, a bunch of different angles, right. As a player, um, both at the, at the minor league level, and we're talking now back into the mid nineties. Um, and then my major league career began um, in, in the late 1990s. And honestly, not enough has changed. I think, um, obviously want to continue to take cues from the, the marginalized communities that we're, we're talking about. But the mo so when, whenever we hear these conversations come up, and I know we talked about it at the youth level, but at the, at the major league level, it's especially important to call out uh, these words and, and actions is just completely unacceptable. And then for me and others who are standing in front of the room or listening to these things and are in positions of authority, just say that we're not going to tolerate these things under uh, any circumstances. Make it unequivocally clear that I, I find them unacceptable and that they don't have uh, a place in our clubhouse at all, or for that matter, you know, in our, our fan base. And I think from our organization standpoint, from this giant standpoint, um, our, our organization is prepared to stand behind that. So when we hear something that is racist or bigoted, uh, we should and, and need to speak out and, and loudly and immediately. Um, we, we should say clearly that this isn't something that is funny, no matter how it's framed, um, or that it, we can kind of explain it away as trash talking amongst opposing fans by way of example. It's just flat out racist. It's just flat out hate speech. And it, there's just no place for it um, in our sport. 
Um, and if something like that happened to a, a Giants player, like I mentioned, I, I kind of trust our organization would take a strong stance. Um, I would personally take a strong stance as well and, and just say that this is strictly not going to be tolerated around our team. And I think others uh, will follow suit. But, you know, the, the, those who are, are wearing the uniform um, at the highest level have a real responsibility to set the tone. But I also want to kind of take a step back and hear from others on this. And, um, you know, if, if there's anything in addition to the things I just mentioned, I'd love to hear them. Well, there's something, yeah, that I, it was be, before your time, Gabe, so it was a different regime. And, you know, I think back then there was a starting pitcher who went on one of the baseball talk shows and brought um, one of the clubhouse uh, assistants who happened to be Asian and did a bit where he did a lot of bowing, a lot of um, kind of microaggressions towards this person. Um, and, you know, obviously the Asian community was very upset but everybody kind of around the Asian, like that was not a part of this was kind of like, it's not a big deal. It was just funny. You know, even articles I read with PR explained it away saying, Hey, these two are friends, so it's fine. And, you know, I, I think things like that are just completely unacceptable, especially when obviously the pitcher is in a position of power and, you know, obviously the, the clubhouse assistant has to laugh it off and, beyond that as a member of the media who has been in clubhouses and things like that. Um, you know, I remember I was sitting by myself writing the story at, at the press box and one of the PR people came up to me and said, Hey, this picture is making apology today. And I said, okay. And they're like, we'd like you to come. And it was basically, so I could be the Asian person that he was apologizing to. And I found that completely unacceptable. And I think that ties back to the fact that a, I was the only Asian person there to ask, you know, first of all. And second of all, that somehow they thought that <laughs> him apologizing to me, to me, was going to help. So I, I think, you know, Gabe, it sounds like you're really trying to change that mentality completely. But I think it's just really important um, for the people at the very top to kind of say this behavior is unacceptable as even as a joke. So um, just wanted to share that experience that, you know, I think, you know, obviously I think the Giants are a great organization, but it still happens even in places that I think are deemed as safe or that are, you know, first-class organizations. Without question. And I really, really appreciate that kind of raising the bar for us. We just have to do better um, at every stage. So I really, really, really appreciate that. Um, if there's nothing else or there's there's not more opportunity to talk about um, this topic, I think now would be a good time for Leanna and Carmen to kind of discuss the Atlanta shootings, um, the over-sexualization of AAPI women in baseball uniforms. I, mean, I know we touched on, on this uh, coming up earlier in the discussion and then really promoting more uh, career women like oh, Kim Ng. And, and I'm excited to hear thoughts on this. Um, I can talk more about like Kim Ng, like working in minor league or in baseball in general. We, when we were putting together this panel, we were even struggling to find AAPI women to even ask. And I think a lot of that was really represented um, when I was one of five Asians to walk into baseball winter meetings and look around and I didn't see anybody that looked like me. Like I didn't see anyone that even like was of a different like culture, even with Latinx and black, it was very white dominated. And I think that having women like Kim Ng break the bamboo ceiling and really not just shatter the glass, but the bamboo ceiling for us is like our version. Most AAPI members cannot pass that middle management level. And I know we talked about the players, but a lot of what we just mentioned is not also translates to the front office and other extremities of baseball, the philanthropy side, like Travis company baseballism, all the, and Carmen being in media. I think a lot of that representation is important and being cognizant of bringing API talent and like that skill set into the front office and into media roles and into different companies is really important because that sets that gen next generation up to be like, oh, I see that person is there. I can be that person 
we're also seeing this with Kamala Harris, like now little AAPI girls see themselves in a vice president. And I think that could be easily be translated to baseball if we could promote more AAPI people into positions of power. And while they get there, they can lift and climb. And I know we're going to talk about sponsorship and um, mentorship later, but I also think that's a huge piece of getting that talent into the right places. Yeah, I totally echo, Liana, what you just said. Um, and just to touch a little bit on the over-sexualization of AAPI women, I mean, you know, I, I obviously am more of a public figure in the sense that, you know, people see me and they feel free to say whatever they want to say to me on the internet. And there's certainly been a lot of things that are very inappropriate and that fall within that category. And I think that's a real problem. You know, it's it's certainly created like a a fear inside of me, Gabe, whenever I get back to the clubhouse, you'll, you will never see me in anything but long sleeves and long pants because I'm so cognizant of it because of what other people have made me kind of feel about it. So I, I think it's really important to not only have representation of women, which I think is super important in, in sports media, but I think it's really important to have Asian women because I mean, you know, I, I, there was one point where I was like, I think I'm going to quit because I was just getting people telling me to make them sandwiches and like all this horrible stuff. And I was just like, I can't do this anymore. And, um, I got an email from a 14 year old Asian girl who said, you know, I finally see somebody who looks like me and I feel like I can do this. And I think that's like really important. You know, it was one email out of like million hate comments, but obviously I think this is why it's like super important to keep doing these things and to keep, you know, like Liana was saying, break through that bamboo ceiling because somebody has to do it. So we have to start somewhere and hopefully we can just get more little girls to, to want to be involved in baseball. It's a really, really powerful uh, and important story uh, being in the clubhouse. It's embarrassing that that, um, that that experience is, is the one that brings out the emotion and um, really glad that, that, that you have that email exchange and, and that that inspired you to kind of stay with it. Um, I, if others have personal experiences, I, I think that this, I, I would just like to hear them um, in clubhouses, outside, um, interacting with people that, that just um, treated you improperly or in, in a, more than anything else inappropriately. I think on the on the representation note, sort of following on the themes of, of being a woman and being a particular uh, Asian woman, um, and I know Gabe, uh, you happen to be in Miami waiting to play the Marlins this weekend. Um, you know, when when Kim Ng was finally promoted to the positions she's well deserved for a very long time, um, I, I heard a lot of different narratives. There were uh, generally the white women who were just celebrating the fact that she was a woman. And then there were your, your typical colorblind, genderblind uh, white men who were just like, it didn't matter what she looked like. She's just good. She's the best for the job. Mm -hmm. Well, it matters that she's Asian, right? It, it matters that she's a woman. It matters she's an Asian and a woman in that role in a very non-diverse across both spectrums that she is where she is. So I, I think when we even celebrate people like her, it, it has to be in the context of it took that long because of both of those identities and she succeeded into that role despite all the discrimination she has faced, most of which I would bet that she's never ever gonna share, right? The private comments, the snide remarks and all the things that, you know, that she didn't belong in to put it very nicely. So, so you know, I, I think we're getting to a point where it is better, right? Um, you know, even our manager down here, you know, Dave Roberts is of, of Japanese and black descent. And, you know, he advocates for both communities. So it means a lot. You know, both of our teams have had Asian born players. I mean, sure, I like it, but the reason I'm a diehard Dodger fan is because of Channel Park. Most Koreans in America are. And, and so, you know, I, it, it goes beyond performance. It goes beyond that. I think, you know, we really have to relish that. Um, you know, so, I mean, Carmen, I'm sorry, too. I, I think, you know, having grown up here in the States and just buying into the narrative that we were taught within our, our school systems, within the media, I think to a large degree, many of us were at one point either explicitly or blindly complicit in some of these things that made other people suffer. And I'm, I'm glad that we're having these discussions to make sure that, you know, one, we fix our habits and we're raising a next generation of kids uh, who, who are more mindful and, you know, just cut it out. And so, um, yeah, just, 
really, really grateful for this conversation. Yeah, if I could add to that, I just want to applaud Liana and Carmen and being in the positions they are and kind of stepping outside the box, you know, and being women in the baseball community, because, I mean, I don't want to put everything on everybody else as, as an Asian person, right? There's some, there's things that we can do better to put ourselves in a better position to succeed in different categories. So, I mean, it's just to have people that have the courage to do things, you know, without other Asian people doing it is huge, right? I mean, if you're, if you're an Asian parent and you have an Asian kid, sign your kid up for baseball, even though the dozen Asian other people you hang out with don't play baseball. Because the more people we can get on the baseball field or into team sports in general, they become allies for you. Like, I guarantee you any of the white guys that I played with in college, if they saw an Asian grandma walking down the street getting beat up because they knew me, that means something, right? They become allies. So if we can have the guts to do things that aren't normally Asian, it'll put our whole community in a, in a different level. So, I mean, instead of maybe hanging out with just your Asian friends all the time, put yourself in a different position that's maybe a little bit more uncomfortable because systematically that'll start changing things, right? The more, the more people that don't know Asian people that begin knowing Asian people, they become allies for you. Like I guarantee you every single, you know, white, black guy, Latin guy, whatever that created an Asian hate crime, He's never met an Asian personally in his life or her life. So I think the more that we can integrate ourselves and have the courage to integrate ourselves in, in, in places where we're not usually seeing, that will help us you know, become stronger as a community and just help everyone just, just become more one than you know, there's black people, there's Asian people, there's white people. We need to all come together and, and know each other so we can become allies of each other. Love that. Do, do, you, do you have suggestions, Travis, on... Um how we can kind of spark some of those discussions in the clubhouse. Like one thing that comes to mind is I know, you know, our, our bench coach Kai Correa um, is, is there a way that we can kind of promote a conversation like that? We also have um, a Japanese um, bullpen catcher who is very well respected in our clubhouse. Um, and I'm just wondering if there are ways to, to kind of incubate or, or start that kind of challenging conversation specific specific talking points or, or ways we can get that going? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Asian people just need need to see that that it can be done. You know, guys like Shane Victorino led the way for, for me to play baseball when I was a kid. So if we can just get those guys out there and just say, hey, you know, I'm Asian, I play baseball, I'm good at it, you can succeed at this. So that, you know, for the people that aren't as comfortable and don't have, you know, and the, the non Leon and Carmen's of the world that that have to have someone else leading leading them. They're okay. Oh, there's there's three other Asian people here. I feel more comfortable in this environment. If we could somehow, you know, allow those guys to lead and say, hey, you know, I'm Asian. I play baseball. This is a safe place for us. It'll help, you know, open the floodgates for more Asian ball players. You know, more Asian women in the game. And I think that's just a part, that's a plus for everybody. Well, on that note, I mean, Travis, you said you you know you talked about sort of. Want, you know, hand to hand combat, if we, if we can use that, you know, uh, phrase to talk about building empathy and building relationships, right? I think, um, and I don't know about athletes, but many, many people who are Asian or any sort of demographic, um, as, as you mentioned, Carmen, like, you don't want to be the token that's also being told like, hey, you're Asian, talk about Asian stuff, because it's May, right? Like, it, it needs to be done uh, thoughtfully. And, and the people who are leading these conversations, you know, have to be brought into sort of the, you know, the camp of understanding that. So I, I think, you know, what it, what it also has to involve is those of us in the community who have, um, you know, resources or opportunities for them to come and not only share, but also learn together. Um, because, I, you know, if, if we're talking, you know, to bring in, um, you know, any of the Korean pitchers to use an example, to talk about Korean American issues, they don't know, they didn't grow up here, right? But from a visible perspective, they may be expected to speak on these things. So I, I think it is in concert, right? Like, you know, are these folks who represent our community visibly, are they, you know, prepared? Are they, you know, um, uh, trained or, you know, just even coached on, on how to talk about it? And that is on all of us, right? Um, baseball player or not, I, I think um, when, when it comes to, you know, are you a role model because you're a baseball player? Unfortunately, yes, because you, you share a public face in a public image, right? And so, you know, how do we have these private conversations calling folks in um, and to make sure that they don't feel it as a burden to uh, be the one voice talking on issues, but so that they feel equipped and, and strong and confident about talking through these issues. And then again, that's, I think that's on all of us. Thanks, Jerry. 
anybody else on this topic before we move on to to what I think is going to be a really important uh, discussion point? Okay, cool. I, I just wanted to to ask um, one question, and this is you know really for for me to take some notes and and just think through in my own space and time. But people in positions of power, uh, like myself, in in our workplace, what are some of the ways? And and I think Carmen uh, really probably has an incredible perspective here. Um, what are some of the ways that we can make your your experiences better? I mean, I, I certainly think that one of the things that can be done is to elevate kind of these minority voices. Um, you know, as I look around to colleagues that I have, they're all white men. You know, you you rarely see female beat writers, um, and if they are, maybe they're they're not of color. So, I think being able to elevate these voices, make sure that they're heard, is something that is is really crucial because um, obviously diverse perspectives is something that is important. Um, and there's just not enough of that in baseball. Um, I, I also think that in general, you know, being able to educate, you know, the team, yourself, your friends, your family on kind of the root of where a lot of this racism comes from, you know, even as somebody who I, I consider myself an ally of, of black people, and I didn't really understand how systemic everything was until I read some books, watched some documentaries, really started to understand how deeply rooted racism was in our country. And I think um, just educating yourself on the history of where all this comes from um, can really help people start to relate and understand why this is a real problem. And it's not just about a couple of old people being beat up on the street. It, it goes beyond that. And it's deeper than that. Thank you. I think from a baseball perspective, there's one really, one, one of many, but one particularly very ugly incident that sticks to my mind, um, which was in the 2017 World Series when Houston Astros player Yuli Gurriel made a blatant uh, racist eye gesture uh, towards Jude Darvish. Um, it wasn't dealt with it in the game. It wasn't dealt with it in the moment the suspension that came down was to be started in the next season. Um, you know, hysterically, we now found out more information about that season, which makes it even more the comical and in terms of the Houston organization, but their lack of uh, stepping up in the moment to keep one of their stars players accountable to a blatant racist gesture that they were getting called out for everywhere. Um, and then when he came back to the plate the next time, he got a standing ovation. Not keeping your own players accountable. And again, I, I, my, my bar for professionalism from the Houston organization is negative, given what we know. However, baseball didn't stand up, right? The commissioner's office, the league office, the players union did not keep anybody accountable because he was a great player in the World Series. There were other incidents, even at recent as this weekend, where... Uh, uh, Taiwanese-born player Yu Chang received a barrage of racist tweets. So what, what are we going to do about that, right? What are we doing to keep folks accountable? And not just the players. You, you can, we have the technology to find out which fan said what, to ban them from stadiums, to take away their season ticket rights. Um, you know, even during that Houston series, I had a friend in Houston send me pictures and, and shared widely of a fan, a season ticket holder, doing that gesture to our players. That person's season tickets were not at risk. They, they would face no repercussions. And so what it actually does is one, the, the pain never gets dealt with, but two, it, it sends a strong message the other way that those things will never have any repercussions. And what are we teaching to our entire generation of young people who watch that to say that that's okay. And not only that's okay, you're gonna get a standing ovation from 50,000 people in a baseball stadium for doing that. And, and so, um, you know, incidents like that hurt. Um, and, and so, you know, in, institutionally as, as teams, as businesses, if you're not willing to forego some money and, and some opportunity um, in a capitalistic society, even baseball is, you know, I don't think we can ever take organizations seriously when they put out these nice statements, these nice tweets, these nice Instagram squares that say, we strongly condemn X, Y, Z, and we stand with the ABC community. We see it over and over again, but without real action, and sometimes it has to be punitive action, um, I, I am not hopeful that we're gonna see 
then you're going to lose millions of followers and fans because I know people who don't watch baseball because of that. It's, it's, you know, it's also bad for business, which doesn't make any sense to me. That was really helpful. Um, I just want to make sure that, that we, that everybody has a chance to touch on this. Um, I'm, I, I want to actually circle back to some of that, Jerry, if, if that's all right, but I'd, I'd love to hear other perspectives as well. So I really think, okay, first, thanks for acknowledging that you're in a position of power. A lot of cis white men don't do that. Um, I think it's important to create mentorship and sponsorship. So mentorship for those entering the baseball industry for the very first time and helping build up their skill set and talent and being a sponsor, saying someone's name in a room of like hundreds of opportunities, I think is so important. I think it's incredible that you have been doing that with Alyssa this year, but I think it also, you could do that more for other un marginalized and underrepresented populations. And I think Pipeline for Change is a great example of that. Now we're gonna talk about what you guys do, but creating equity for the AAPI community in baseball is so important. And I think these are some small steps we can do to create that equity for us. Does that start with, um, does that start with hiring and just kind of stripping out as much bias as possible? What, what, do you, what do you do when, when you think about like how to surround yourself with the most diverse group of decision makers? I think some of it does start at the pipeline of talent coming into your organization. It really, you want to make sure you have a diverse slate of candidates. I know like with the NFL, with the Rooney rule that they have one person of color interviewing, I think MLB could easily follow suit within all levels. I know making sure that you guys have a coach that can speak the language of your players is really important. Um, even in the front office standpoint, when you are recruiting, when I was with Major League Baseball, like in this diversity pipeline, I think we could have reached out better to certain marginalized groups and really looked at the data. Like you guys use sabermetrics, in terms of diversity recruiting, we look at the data and look at like races and genders and sexual orientation and really like seeing where the opportunities are and who is falling through the cracks in your recruiting pipeline. You think that could really help you diversify the slate of people you're interviewing and getting through the interview process and eventually hiring. Yeah, definitely hearing that loud and clear. Um, so it's kind of diversi diver diversifying the, the candidate pool um, and then, and then once we're able to get a more diverse group of decision makers in place, and even if they're starting out at more of an entry level position, and I think we've touched on this a bit, but it's, it's advocating for at the right time, advocating for those individuals, um, calling out, um, the reasons that they are really good at, at their jobs and then providing mentorship programs, um, for those communities at, at, at every turn. And, and I think that is gonna, you, you had mentioned the position of power and, and um, you know, kind of how homogenous it is across baseball. I'm, I'm hearing that it's, it's gonna take those folks, myself included, um, to not just create the pipeline, but, but also once we have those employees in our system, promote them and, and, and support them. Is, is that fair and ac an accurate kind of encapsulation of what we've been discussing? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And I also don't want to put it all on people in positions of power, right? In order to hire a minority candidate, there have to be minority candidates that want to do the job. I mean, I'm, in, I'm in a smaller position of power right now running baseballism. And honestly, there's not a lot of not a lot of Asian candidates that, that apply for our jobs because I mean, we're in baseball too. And there's just not a lot to choose from. And I don't, I honestly don't want to hire the fifth best candidate just because that person's Asian, right? In order for a person of power to make a good hire, a good minority hire, there has to be a minority person that is the best job for the candidate. I mean, the best person for the job. A candidate for the best, that is the best person for the job, right? You want to hire someone that's the 10th best candidate because they're a minority. And I think we as a, as a culture, as, as a, an ethnic group, have to open our minds to being more than just the stereotypical Asian professions, more, more than just, I mean, doctors are great, but 
we, we all will, we're doctors, nurses, you know, accountants. Can we, can we open our minds and say, hey, Asians can succeed in different, in different uh, professions? And so I think we got to put it on ourselves to say, hey, if we want my, more minority hires in Major League Baseball or professional sports, there has to be more people taking risks, more Asian people taking risks to be in those positions. And so that's a challenge to, to people, you know, to Asian people and Asian Americans in general. Like, can we step outside that box and have the coach do that? Yeah, and I just wanted to quickly build on that because I, I have another full-time job that we have diversity hiring goals. You know, one of our objectives as a company is to become a very diverse team. And like Liana said, it all starts at the pipeline and the candidate searching. Um, but just to, to uh, counter a little bit what Travis said, I do think that, you know, you, you wait for people to apply, but a lot of people think I can't do that job or I don't have the right skill set or whatever. You know, people talk themselves out of applications all the time, um, especially people in minority groups who have been kind of uh, kind of repressed their whole life um, from from the system. So I think even being proactive and going out and searching for these candidates, because there's something in me that refuses to accept that you can't find somebody of color to take a position that is as good as a white person. Um, I don't know if that's actually true. I have no facts to back that up, but that's just my inherent belief. And so I think potentially setting, um, like, again, doing what Liana said and looking at people um, within the team that are uh, people of color, gender, uh, sexual identity, and not only looking at what percentage of those people you have, but seeing where they lie within the organization. Are they all support people or are they people of leadership? Um, I think that also matters because, you know, a lot of times um, you'll see uh, brown and black people kind of at the bottom of the food chain and it should not be that way. So I, I think just being able to take a realistic look at what is under the hood of the Giants organization and just being like, this is what it is, but we want to be better and here are our goals for the next five years can be a really kind of more tangible approach to it. And in a baseball perspective, I know that uh, a way that many teams, professional teams, engage with local communities is, is through an array of heritage nights, um, which I think are good uh, on its surface. And I think the intent is good. If it comes from the sales department, it is not good. If it is done to sell more tickets and, and to print some T-shirts with the Korean flag infused into the logo, and then they never care about the community outside of that, that's also, I, I think that's actually a net negative right? Because the community just feels uh, exploited for, for ticket sales. And so I, for, for the teams that might be listening, or if you're in these roles, you know, um, you know, perhaps it should be a community engagement led focus, perhaps it should be an executive led focus. You know, um, you know, our, our team down here when in its heyday, they had like 40 different heritage nights for all sorts of different, you know, and it was very evident that it was a marketing led, you know, how many, how many groups of people can we feel can we make feel special to come on these nights and, and boost up sales on, on a Tuesday, Wednesday night game, which I understand the business side of it, right? But if you're dealing with, you know, communities that are, are present, that are marginalized, that are voiceless, um, you know, what are, what are the teams doing, not only from a community partnership perspective, from a financial donation perspective, but providing children and, and young people from those communities to get the experience to come get a tour of the stadium or, you know, meet with some of your staff or meet with your players, it's complex, right? And in most teams, as I know the Giants do as well, has a foundation built into it to do some of the community work. Um, I'm, I'm all for, you know, community nights. I've, I've had my fair share of involvement ones down here. Um, but, you know, is it, can it be perceived as performative or an actual reaching out to make sure that the team has a vested interest in the success of our local communities? Um, and then, so I, I think that's an easy one that's already has some of the wheels in motion. And then based on those relationships, it's really easy to find people from any community to come bring in as guest speakers or as partners or just to check to say like, hey, are we doing these right? Like, we just don't want to make sure that we're, you know, saying the right things. Um, so I, I think those are, you know, really amazing things um, or I guess really easy things that we can that can lead to really amazing impact. That's really cool, Jerry. And I, I think there's um, I, I understand the, the the lack of authenticity that sometimes comes out in, in some of these heritage nights across the industry. Uh, I've experienced them myself and you, you really can tell, you can feel them when they're not authentic. So I appreciate that perspective. And 
you know, obviously this comes with with having more discussions with people in these underrepresented communities about how to how to roll these out and make them successful and feel good to everybody involved. Um, I, I know that that everyone is is um, have, have places to be today and, and have work to do. I feel like we could talk for a really long time and I, I do feel like we just kind of scratched the surface. So hoping that we get another opportunity before we wrap. Is there anything that um, is left unsaid or that we should would really touch on uh, that's important that I, I might personally be missing or we might be missing as a group? I just want to thank thank you again for the opportunity for letting us speak out. I mean, I, I know no, not all, not all the coaches in the MLB are doing this. I think you're the only one. So um, really appreciate uh, the time and the effort that was put into this. And um, I also appreciate the time of, you know, my fe fellow panelists. Uh, it's, it's great to meet you uh, kind of on Zoom. So I, I've heard your names a lot, but um, it's good, great to see you in person. Echo that for sure. Same. And Gabe, we're, we're coming to a game whenever we can, all of us, because I, I think Travis is up north. I'm down south. So we're going to meet right here in the middle in San Francisco. And Dave, if you want some gear, let me know, man. Well, <laughs> go across the street. Well, the store is, is, is right across the street. If there are ways that, that I can help, um, I, I would love to. And, and Travis, like, I, I would be really interested in hearing more at the right time about you know, how, how you hire. Because um, I think there's some interesting things to dig into there. Um, and for both of us, for both of us to, to, to learn. So, um, yeah, also incredibly grateful for everybody's time to today and I know there's a lot of work behind the scenes that, that um, made this easy for for me personally so thanks to everyone for participating and I guess uh, at this point we can sign off and, and catch up again soon that sounds great thank you so much for your time thank you thank thanks, you guys. thank you